Hello and welcome to Chautauqua. Chautauqua is a program where actors and scholars portray first-person accounts of famous people in history. The unusual name comes from Lake Chautauqua, New York, where the first Chautauqua was held in 1874. It began as a training course for Sunday school teachers, but it grew into a traveling road show where politicians, lecturers, and performers brought information and entertainment to cities and towns across the nation. Today, Chautauqua is a humanities program where audiences watch scholars and actors perform on stage in full costume. By the end of the program, you will have learned a great deal about the history surrounding the character's life by just watching and listening to the performance. Our theme is Voices from the Great War. The famous person being portrayed tonight is commander of the American Expeditionary Force during World War I. Tonight's Chautauqua character is the highly distinguished General John Pershing. I'm Angela Rice Beamer at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College. Stay with us. Thank you. I am pleased to be here. As you can see, I am retired from the military. I am now a retired gentleman at leisure, and you can see that, sorry, I've allowed my stomach to grow out along with my hair. I no longer fit into my uniform. Perhaps that was the plan. They asked me to speak about my experiences during the Great War and the lessons we should have learned or did learn. Let me say that it's always easier to speak in hindsight when one is not being shot at about what is a proper decision. It is easier when one is not assigning tens of thousands of men to go to their death. It is easier at a different time to perhaps make the proper decision. I've been retired from the military for over 15 years now and have tried in those 15 years to make this country prepared for what I see as the next war, and now very clearly with Germany again. Here in 1939, it seems obvious to me. It seems clear that Woodrow Wilson's comment that the Great War would be the war to end all wars was one of those typical comments that politicians have the luxury of making, that military men know that you can no more end wars, that you can stop breathing. Because as long as there is humanity, there will be conflict between humanity. And military men will be called upon to settle those conflicts. I did not start as a military man, by the way. I grew up as a farm boy in Missouri. I was not a very good student, but I did graduate from high school and then spent two years teaching freedmen. I still didn't know what I wished to do with my life, but I enjoyed teaching the freedmen how to read and write, these ex-slaves. And so I thought I might wish to be a teacher. When I went to college for a terrible year in Missouri, but I needed a better college. And so on a whim, I applied to West Point. I had heard it was a great school. I arrived there with absolutely no determination to be a military man. My main ambition the first few months seemed to be card playing at night, gambling, drinking, and of course, the ladies. I enjoyed flirtation walk quite a bit at the point, a beautiful romantic place. But somewhere along the line, in those first few months, what they were telling me at the point started to infuse into my soul. Maybe I'd been looking for this my entire life to that point. The ideas of duty, honor, country, I started to become infused with the idea that a leader in the military must be obedient to his orders absolutely, unquestioningly. 
He must give 100% of himself at all times. To do less was to cheat the people of the country. And any man who did less than 100% should be driven from the field. That a leader must always be optimistic. It can never, by act, body posture, or whatever it might be, betray the slightest doubt in the ultimate victory. Now, some of those lessons I learned in the field after West Point. And while I was not a great student at West Point, I stayed roughly in the middle of my class. I had proudly served as each leadership position in the cadet corps. I graduated from the point and then went off and fought Indians in the West for six years. Some other years served. By 1898, I was in position. I was sent to Cuba at the head of the 10th Cavalry. Now, I had served with the 10th Cavalry before in the West. The 10th Cavalry was the famous Negro Buffalo soldiers. Very brave, very courageous, very good soldiers. And I was proud to lead them again in San Juan, up San Juan Hill and Kettle Hill. You know, it was said of me after that battle that I was as cool as ice. I must tell the truth. I was absolutely terrified. But I saw that these men, the 10th Cavalry, you had to order them to take cover. They would not take cover. Their relentless desire to accomplish the goal, to finish the mission, was inspiring. And so they inspired me to pretend to be braver than I was. You know, there was another fellow there at that time, too, I thought was incredibly brave. Later, he told me he was always afraid, but he just practiced being brave and did things that terrified him. And after a while, while he was still terrified, everyone thought he was very brave. Well, I thought he was incredibly brave. I thought he was a mule skinner. And here he was, leading the volunteers up San Juan and Kettle Hill. I had met him. I, met, I thought he was a mule skinner because I had met him several days before. I came around the bend in the jungle, and I could hear this commotion. And here was this mule skinner. His team was bogged down in the mud. And I could see that he was an expert at his craft. He used the reins flawlessly, the whip miraculously, and used the greatest cursing I had ever heard. There was brilliant words. I mean, I had been in the military over 12 years at that time, and there were words I had never even imagined could be a curse word. I had dinner with this man some years later in the White House. And he invited me to tell the story of how we met. I said, President Roosevelt, I cannot possibly repeat that story in front of ladies. He laughed. He had the huge belly laugh, especially when it was about himself. Theodore Roosevelt, what an incredible human being. You could say, I, from the first time I met him, I was infatuated by him. My military career, probably the only other human being who affected me as much, was at a party in 1903 in Washington, D.C. I'd just come back from the Philippines. And as a captain, I came to this fancy soiree. I still was no longer drinking or playing cards. I had given that up, but I was still quite interested in the ladies. And there was this woman. This young thing was so beautiful. Quickly, I asked around and found out that she was one of the leading socialites of Washington. She was Senator Warren, Senator Warren of Wyoming, one of the most powerful men in the government. Senator Warren's daughter, pursued by every young man. And then they looked at me and said, you'll never have a chance being a soldier. Well, I tried to speak with her. I introduced myself. We spoke for a brief moment. I went out and told my friend Charlie Dawes. I said, Charlie, I have met the girl that God has made for me. He said, how does she feel about you? I don't think she knows I exist. I, know. I went to every party I could through the fall and into the winter. Any time I could because I knew she would be there. And I could meet up with this angel. 
And each time I introduced myself, I'm Captain John Pershing. And she slowly started to say, yes, I know. You've introduced yourself to me many times. I didn't realize that she had already decided that she wanted to torture me and liked me quite a bit. One night, I left the party and there was snow up to my ankles and I started to walk back to my cab, uh, my room. And I heard the angel's voice behind me. She said, Captain John Pershing? And it was her. Why don't you join me in my coach and we'll give you a ride back so you don't have to walk in the blizzard? I said, Madam, you are unchaperoned. It would be totally inappropriate for me to be seen climbing into your carriage. She said, makes sense. Then she smiled and laughed and said, walk around the corner, we'll pick you up there. <laughs> we were married within months. It took me six months to kiss her. I was so afraid and it was such a sacred moment. Married later that year, and over the next 11 years, we had four children. By then, I had risen. My honeymoon was off to watch the Russell-Japanese War, to learn about the modern face of war. And then I was sent back to Washington, D.C., called into the War Department, thinking I was in trouble for something. And I was told that the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, and Senator Warren had decided to make me a general, over 862 senior officers who were not pleased. I didn't think I just warranted this command, this new post, but I took it. And they sent me off to the Philippines for another six years. And then back to the United States in San Francisco. And then I was stationed in Texas in, a, well, a dark, period happened in my life, and I shan't talk about it, but I started to think about retiring from the military, and then came along, just as I decided to retire, Pancho Villa attacked New Mexico. And so I was sent in 1916 on this glorious chase of Pancho Villa across Mexico with 10,000 men in my command. It was a total waste of time. Almost cost the war with Mexico by the end. And we never really saw him. The only positive thing that came out of it was another unique individual that I met. As I was getting ready to go to Mexico, I was, of course, creating the officer corps, the staff that would lead. And this young man appeared outside my office very early the first morning. I'd never seen him before. Apparently, he was AWOL from his regular unit and had come because he wanted to go to Mexico, and he jumped up and saluted and said, General, I wish to go to Mexico. And I said, well, everyone does. Why should I take you? And he said, because I want it more, sir. I walked past him, went in my office. This went on for a week. I must say, I decided after the third day that I would take him with me. I just wanted to torture Lieutenant George Patton a bit more. So for the next week, I let him jump up every morning and salute me and tell me he, how much he wanted to go. He was like, in Mexico, he was like, you know, your cat. Do you know how your cat will bring back little mice as showing what they have performed and accomplished for you? One day he comes back. He had been in a firefight with Villa's lieutenants and killed two of them. He brought them back to me, strapped their bodies, strapped over the fenders of his automobile. Drove up, the press was, fell in love with him at that moment. And George fell in love with the press at that moment. I've always liked George Patton. He is a bit crazy, but I do like him. But then, of course, as soon as we returned from our fruitless expedition, the war had commenced. April 1917, the war is declared, the Great War. I came to Washington in hope of becoming the head of a division, perhaps. On May 10th, I met with the Secretary of War. And he said to me, well, General, 
We are only sending officers over there who speak French. Do you speak French? We, oui. mais bien sûr. Of course, that was everything I knew. He didn't ask any further questions, and then he turned and said, well, we have in mind for you, command of the first army. I was dumbstruck. I almost wanted to say, wait, I don't speak French. Because this was a, this would be a command of hundreds of thousands of men. I did not feel competent to do such a thing. I was struck. I didn't say anything. I left and, and spent the next two days thinking they must have made a mistake. It couldn't be me. They called me back five days on May 15th. And they said, we've made another decision. And I said, oh, uh, who is command of the American Expeditionary Forces? And they said, General John Pershing will be in command of the whole entire American Expeditionary Force. I said, there's another John Pershing? <laughs> and they said, no, Newton Baker, the Secretary of War, said it's you. Now I was certain to say that I did not feel competent to lead what was to be a three million man army, bigger than anything in the American history combined. But he said it was me. There was no one else who had ever even commanded 10,000 people in the field. Or if they had, it was at Gettysburg, and they were a bit old and senile. And so I was sent. They gave me two basic commands, he and Woodrow Wilson, that I would go to Europe and that I would return. All other military decisions would be made by me. It was terrifying. And very quickly, the weight of the world fell upon me. Of course, it was a complete mess. It has been described that we were not prepared for the war. Well, no one really was when it started. But we, the United States, perhaps more than any other country, was not prepared. The war by then had bogged down. It started in 1914 by we arriving in late June 1917, three years of trench warfare in eastern France. At the whistle, men in these trenches would run across and be machine gunned and killed with artillery, most of them killed, a few straggled back. Later in the day, the whistle would go off over here, they would charge out and be massacred as equally. And this is the way it was. Hundreds of thousands had been killed. You know, it, it gives you a scope of it through the entire American Civil War in four years. In that dreadful conflict, 600,000 men were killed. In four months of the Psalm, 660,000 men were killed in four months. It was a war no one was really prepared for. But we arrived and realized we were much less prepared. The English had a command general staff of 650 men who had served together for decades, planned for decades, could coordinate and read each other's thoughts. The British, I'm sorry, the French had about 350, the Germans had around four or 500. They had spent decades together, we had zero. We finally, by July, had a total of 95 in my staff. I had to find men who knew how to fight a modern war, but no one had. And look at what we faced. Artillery, most of ours dated to Gettysburg. So we had to use French and English artillery, machine guns. Most of them didn't exist in the United States, so we used French and English machine guns. Tanks, we had none. We had to use French tanks. Air Corps, well, we had 55 aeroplanes. Of course, each one of them was obsolete. We had 65 men in the Air Corps, and of that, only 30 could actually fly an aeroplane. And of that 30, only six were not senile and could actually fly an aeroplane in combat. We had an army of 27,000 men. That was it. So we had to recruit, train, transport, 
across the country and across the ocean, three million men, staff them with competent officers, competent leaders, make up competent battalions, companies, divisions, create armies, three armies separate. All of this as quickly as possible in the face of a very hostile enemy. Learning on the job, if you wish. I arrived in June of 1917. Finally, by October, we had trained our men well enough to put them into the line in small battalions. I had two directives I gave my officers, that we would not fight a defensive campaign because the American spirit would not tolerate defensive action. Secondly, that we would not amalgamate. The French and English desired us to amalgamate our men into their units in squads, individuals, as replacements. And I told them I would absolutely categorically against this idea that if American soldiers were going to die in the mud in Europe, they would do it under the American flag, under American officers. The American public would hold no other way. And they yet persisted, the French and English repeatedly pushed for amalgamation day after day after day. Finally, I told them, you may tell us where to fight, you may tell us when to fight, but we will fight as an American army or we will not fight at all. That seemed to get their attention. Finally, by October, our men were in battalions, as I said, and the Germans attacked because they had decided that the Americans, as the French and English, and many Americans believed as well, that the American troops would not fight, that they would quickly lose their stomach for the war like the French had. The French military mutinied the day we, just before we had arrived. Mutinied. Refused to go in the field anymore. The English army was almost collapsing, so everyone felt the American army would quickly fade. And on that day in October 1917, Corporal Gresham and Privates Hay and Enright were killed. The first three Americans to spend their life in the mud in Europe. When I was informed, I cried. Because then I realized that there would be many, many more tears. As I knew, many more men would die. It turned out 53,000 I would order to their death. Another 45,000 would die from the influenza epidemic. The weight of it. But I was so proud of those men. Finally, we launched a, an attack. In May of 1918, our first American army's attack in the war, after the winter had cleared and the roads were good enough to pass. This attack at Catigny, we had over 40% casualties in some of the units. One of the units headed by Theodore Roosevelt Jr., very heroic man, suffered 40% casualties. And as the French retreated out of the battle, they said, now you will retreat. Correct? And the American colonel looked at him and said, retreat? Hell, we just got here. I was proud of them. I walked back into a staff meeting with the English and French and told them bluntly that the next time I heard someone say that the Americans wouldn't fight, I'd tear out their throat with my teeth. I was so incredibly proud. We went to the hospital. And here were these men broken by war. This one private could barely sit up. He had his arm had been shot off at the shoulder. In great pain. And he said, General, I'm sorry, but I can't salute you. I don't have my arm. I said, it is I who should salute you. I went out and told my friend Charlie Dawes, 
that I was so incredibly proud, but that I hope God treated these men better than we did. Charlie was there in part because the great heroes of the war weren't the men always in the front lines, the General MacArthur, who got all the press, but men like General Harvard, who I took out of the line, much to his intense disdain, and forced him to run the logistics, the logistics for this three million man army to move everything around. I learned that modern war, in, in, when I watched the Russo-Japanese War, the modern war wasn't about the great leaders like Stonewall Jackson, great tactics and generals leading from the front. It was about a general who could hold logistics of great armies, could maneuver them properly in gigantic numbers. At Gettysburg, they had 90,000 men. At the Argonne, we had over 600,000. And without coordination with modern weapons, men would be wiped out within moments. Harvard was a brilliant at getting the supplies where we needed to be. And another man, Charlie, Charlie Dawes. Charlie showed up in Europe as a colonel. His family had connections. He was the most unmilitary man I had ever met. He showed up in a uniform of a corporal or something. I don't know where he found this uniform. And I said, Charlie, what are you doing here? And I said, but I've got a job for you. You are a devious human being, Charlie, completely without ethics. He was a banker. <laughs> he nodded his head, and I said, I need someone to run supply. I don't care where you get it. And he said, well, you probably won't want to know where I get it. And I said, fine, just get it. Charlie Dawes performed brilliantly. He wasn't much of a soldier, as I said. Any time we have a staff meeting, I would have to get my aide to get him dressed properly so the English and French wouldn't make fun of us. And at every staff meeting, when I came in, all the officers stood, of course. That was protocol. Not Charlie. Never did. Finally, one day, he was sitting there. I'm, everyone's standing. I finally looked at him and said, Charlie, when the commanding officer comes in, it is customary to at least move your cigar from one side of the face to the other. He did and went back to reading the New York Times. But he was great to have around. I could really talk to Charlie that I could not talk to everyone else. Another young man who was vital. He was a young colonel when I met him. I had been addressing a general who had completely messed up an, uh, an operation, a, uh, a technical maneuver could not understand it, could not explain it. And I was furious. And as I was leaving, this man reached out and grabbed my arm, a breach of military etiquette, which was amazing, amazing to everybody. There was a gas went out from all the other officers because this young officer had destroyed his career by touching the commanding general, not just touching him, grabbing him as he walked by. I turned around, burning rays into this young colonel, and he said, General, you have been unfair. And then he went on to describe the maneuver perfectly, what had been planned, and every step that went wrong. I was shocked by the genius of this man. He quickly became a general, George Marshall, George C. Marshall, one of the great leaders of the war because he was a man who planned all the campaigns. Planned how to get the supplies and logistics there, and then Harbert and Dawes did it. But our second battle was at Bella Wood. The Marines, I was very proud of them again. But now the Germans were starting to fear the Americans. One German prisoner said, they fight like savages, which is exactly what I wanted. I told them that when you get into this, don't be dainty about it. This is about murdering other human beings. Make sure you do it. At the Battle of Bella Wood, it was so ruthless at the time, General Marshall ordered some drivers and cooks into the line. And he told them, basically, your duty is to die east of the rail line. They said, yes, sir, and went to their positions. These men, the courage of them, 
After the Battle of Bella Wood, the Marines were, well, the Marine colonel who led that battle, the, the first time the Marines went in, his battle cry was, you sons of bitches, do you want to live forever? And off they charged. Of course, he was a man not to be trifled with. Finally, the French said, well, you've lost 50% of your men. Will you retreat now? And he said simply, when the first division is down to just two men, we will be echeloned in depth, and we will be attacking towards Berlin. By then, everyone started to respect what we could do. Of course, that led into the Battle of Saint Mihiel in September and October of 1918. Well, we took a position that the French had spent four years trying to take, we took in three days. And then we moved our entire army out in a logistics phenomena. Never before in history had a military move the way we did. Out of the combat at San Miguel, we moved in three weeks to plan, organize, and move 15 divisions, 550,000 men to the Argonne. But not just that. 40,000 tons of ammunition alone. We had to build 80 supply depots, and Charlie had to get the supplies there. We had to build a railroad, several roads, 44 hospitals, move 1,400 aeroplanes, 267 tanks, 5,000 pieces of artillery. And we did it in three weeks. An amazing movement, General Marshall plan and the men executed and we went into the line in late October and we made well for the first 12 days but then it bogged down the Gargon forest terrible place to fight 85,000 men killed in two weeks our men it was a just horrible wait and I didn't know what to do and then we decided that we were fighting the wrong war we were using the wrong tactics. And so we took the men, most of the men, out of the line while still in combat, stripped units back, and combined them with the new units. By then, we were bringing in 10,000 new soldiers a day to the lines. We retrained. We were trained to leave strong points alone, just surround them and blast them with artillery and then go around them with specialized units that are trained for both purposes. On November 1st, we started up again. In seven days, we took all three German lines that had never been touched in four years. We broke through and were on our way to Berlin. And then, of course, something against my judgment on the 11th day, or the 11th hour, of the 11th day of the 11th month, the armistice was settled and went into effect. As I say, I was against it, because I believe Germany, if not fully defeated militarily, would not learn the lesson and would quickly become a troublesome thing for Europe again, as we are seeing. But that was beyond my scale. That was politics. And I do not believe military men should be in politics at all, especially not in service. I tried my best as the war ended to take care of uh, men. I tried my best to keep the military strong. But Congress cut the army from 3 million to 250,000 in 1919 down to 100,000 in 1920. I tried to at least prepare the officer corps. I created what we call the War College, where officers would rotate in at different times and learn the newest techniques, the newest pieces of equipment, be trained in the latest tactics and the latest logistics so that we would be prepared, if not with a large army, that the American people seem to be against, but with a leadership group. But we would not have to fumble around and go through the time in Europe 
going through and getting rid of those who couldn't do the job. I was very proud that I kept my commitment as a leader not to be favorites. The thing of a general must be that he cannot be personal in any way, shape, or form. He must be impersonal because he's sending men to die. But he also must be willing to face the fact that maybe an old friend from West Point cannot do the job. You must remove them. And this fellow over here, he may have no background, no pedigree. He may only be in a lieutenant. But if he's capable, he should be promoted. I remember one time, a man I sort of revered. And the typical of my mindset then, I was stopped on a rainy night by this private standing in the road in the mud. And he said he had orders that everyone had to get out of the vehicle and be identified. They had to get out of the vehicle, that is how the order read. And so my driver got out and told him, this is General Pershing's car. The general will not get out of the car and walk in the mud for you, private. And he said, sorry, sir, I have my orders. My aide got out and tried to indicate to this poor soldier that his life expectancy was zero if he continued on this course. The private only said, sir, I have my orders. I finally got out of the car in the pouring rain, walked over to this young man, shaking with fear he was at that moment. I'm being covered in rain, my brand new boots and uniform are caked now up to my knees in mud. I looked at him and he said, Sorry, General, but I have my orders. I just glared at him. Got back in the car, looked at Charlie and said, make that man a sergeant. At least he follows orders. Before I take your questions, there's been much comment now from some people like General MacArthur. As a war is starting to warm up, General MacArthur has again started all his claims. First of all, if you listen to Char Douglas MacArthur very much, you will notice that he is the fought the Battle of the Argonne completely by himself. There apparently was no one there except him. But beyond that, he has talked about the glory of war. He talks about war being glorious and heroic. And I disagree with him intensely. There is no glory in dying for your country, really. There is no glory in killing for your country. There is no glory in maiming for your country. There are, of course, the glorious dead who gave their last full measure, as Lincoln said. But they would be more glorious if they were alive, life is the greatest glory. And we should do everything we can to maintain it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. We're back, and I'm here with Doug Mistler, who's just performed as General John Pershing. Thank you for coming to Montgomery again. It's always wonderful. It's been, what, five years since I was here last, so I'm thrilled to come back. Mm -hmm. Good to have you. Um, how do you pick the people that you portray? Well, in this case, I, it, I was called by Judy Dobbs of the Maryland Humanities and said, you know, we're doing something in World War I. We would love to have someone do John Pershing we'd like you to do John Pershing. And I was like, really? Okay. Um, I didn't know much about him. I knew a little bit. So yeah, that was the start of it about a, just a year, almost a year ago when I first heard. So you have some time to do research. Yes. What is your process? And do you uh, just do the regular internet searches and then go to the books and, and uh, what, what absolutely I do I start with Wikipedia because I like to grab their life in a series of pieces in a digestible form and then as I start reading their biographies or autobiographies that there are some there aren't with Pershing but biographies I start to focus on those stories 
as my heaviest concentration. I knew in this one that I would have to learn a lot of, about World War I, directly the battles um, and the names and the dates, and that for this character particularly, he would be focused on the exact date. Right. And that. So he, he was there. <laughs> right. And on the other hand, there wasn't as much uh, for this character of prime documents of exact quotes. He really didn't have an autobiography. He wrote a, a description of the war, but it's mostly very, very dry and technical. So it won the Pulitzer Prize, but you're like, how? <laughs> it's terrible, terrible book. That is interesting. I wonder if he's the only uh, general of an army that has won a Pulitzer Prize. I, it was for history. I don't right? know. I it could so. be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, um, the characters that you picked, or the ones that we've seen at Montgomery College, have a very dynamic spirit. Do you pick them, or do they pick you? Uh, well, I think in part that's why I got chosen for Pershing. Uh, I'm loud and obnoxious, I guess. I don't know. Uh, I, yes, most of my characters, there's a few newer characters that I do that I haven't done. Her Ernie Pyle is one that, he's a strong character, but he's a quiet man. Uh, but yeah, a lot of the others, are, I, I'm drawn to the more flamboyant characters. Someone outside, we were just talking about P.T. Barnum and, and Theodore Roosevelt, two of my favorite characters, but they're very strong, unique individuals. And they're really fun to spend time with them. So in a way, I am drawn to those William, types of characters. William Lloyd Garrison was another one of your characters. He was a strong sort of iconoclast in a way. Right, and right. And Jefferson Davis was another that you Yes, on. yes, strongly opinionated. Even though both of those off stage were very quiet men and gentlemen. But in the public spotlight, they had their cause and they were adamant about it. So yes. What do you think motivated Pershing? Well, Pershing uh, is a man, as I said, of duty, honor, country. Uh, when he decides on a military career, he is devoted to it. Um, he believes he must do the best of his ability to do whatever the country calls on him to do. Uh, even if sometimes we didn't get into it, but some of the things that happened in the Philippines were a little dark and a little mean or as we talked about today, the, the racial situation within the military. He made a practical military decision. Uh, he, he's very much driven by duty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You talked, um, but the, the television audience didn't hear it in your question and answer session. You talked about the 92nd and the 93rd um, mm -hmm. divisions. divisions and them being commanded by the French. Yes. And that was a practical decision that he made. And did, can you elaborate on that a little bit? More? Right. The 92nd and 93rd were, as he would call them, Negro or African American uh, divisions. Uh, they there was no way the American troops, the white troops, would tolerate them uh, in the field with them, even in the mess with them, uh, in hospitals with them. America was a segregated society, um, and there was no thought by Pershing to, uh, someone asked in the audience, to integrate the military. And there was no thought. That never came up in the first place, but there was no thought by anyone of doing that. And in fact, the opposite, Pershing sent a letter out saying, making it clear to people that the black troops and white troops will not eat together, they will not uh, be housed together, they will not be in the lines together because some of the white troops had said they would quit and would not fight at all if blacks were in the, in the trenches with them. So the racial animosity at that time was so strong Pershing makes the practical military decision. And he doesn't really talk about it, doesn't really defend it. He just says, this is what we're doing. And it's very clear that he did it. He had great respect for African-American troops because he commanded the 10th Cavalry in the West and in the charge up San Juan Hill. And they were, very, it was a black cavalry union, Buffalo soldiers. And they were incredibly brave, incredibly good fighters. And he wanted that, but he also knew that the practicality was the white troops. He couldn't jeopardize the military efficiency by this social experiment, not in a war. Yes, he needed things done 
it, and there would be no uh, mutiny as the French as did the French had mutiny. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did they? Get I think at another time he might have, if he had been ordered by the president to integrate the military, he would have done what he was ordered. He might have grumbled a bit because this is going to cause problems, but he would have tried to make it work. I but, like the story you told about the, um, was he a private who uh, yes. had been given orders <laughs> to uh, have every car checked and you had to get, a, and, and, and Pershing had to get out of the car and stand in the mud in the rain, but he <laughs> followed orders. He was very adamant. He wasn't deterred by higher rank no. he'd been given. It's this poor private who's making the general of the army get out of the car in a rainy night in the mud to be identified. Uh, and yeah, and then Pershing promotes him to sergeant because at least he follows orders. Yes. Uh, it is one of my favorite little stories about Pershing. But let, I want to do one story that's the opposite of that. In the Philippines, there was a water hole that uh, everyone knew had cholera in it, and he made it off limits. He ordered his men, you cannot drink out of that water hole, you'll get sick. And two men did, and he refused them medical treatment. He said, I gave an order that no one is to drink from that trough. They will not get military, they will not get medical support. They disobeyed an order and they died. And he may have had a tough night about that, but publicly he didn't. Orders are orders. So the young private in the rain, one of my favorite stories. Yeah, that, that is a good one. Um, what do you think he felt was his greatest accomplishment? Uh, probably, ultimately, his son. Warren, I think ultimately, militarily, um, leading the army, pulling that army together. It was an amazing thing to do in such a sh short time. In 12 months, they went from nothing, basically nothing, to a very sophisticated expert military that was by far, by October, November 1918, there was nothing in the world that compared to the American military. It was something else again. Clearly changed the battlefield in Europe. The Germans knew it, the French knew it, everyone knew it. He mentions that in a speech he gives to uh, officers that it was the greatest modern fighting force in history. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he was very proud that they had put that together. And he never really, again, we talked in there about MacArthur and others. He never took great credit for it. He was proud of it, but he always talked about the group achievement. You know, the generals that helped him, General Harbord, General uh, uh, Marshall, and all the rest. General Liggett, we didn't talk about much tonight, who really came up with the idea of retraining the men in the middle of the Argonne battle. When they bogged down, he said, wait, we need to retrain them in different techniques did it on the fly in two weeks, put them back in the line, and they're a much more effective coordinated force once they do that. That's amazing stuff to do that on the fly in the middle of the war. Yes, they may, as a, one gentleman asked, there were mistakes made, and certainly mistakes killed men, but there were also some brilliant decisions as well. And uh, Pershing was very aware of the responsibility of sending soldiers possibly to their death. He it, was not insensitive to that. That didn't no. escape him at all. And even, and I didn't really bring it up, uh, just before the Battle of the Argonne, he had led, he was technically the head of the American Expeditionary Force, and there was the First Army, Second Army, and Third Army. He was head of the First Army. For the Argonne, he moved himself out. He said, I can't possibly handle all this and be in charge of the First Army as well. It is best for the Army if I move out. I don't think you would have seen a MacArthur do that, or certainly not a Patton. Patton wanted to be in the battle. He wouldn't want to be behind lines. What do you think was his biggest defeat, or what, he, what you think and what he might have thought might have been his biggest defeat? Interesting. Um, again, I always go back, his biggest loss is his family when they, when his three daughters, the oldest one is seven, mm -hmm. and his wife are burned to death in their building. And he felt recriminations, you know, why wasn't I there? Why didn't I move them with me? How could this happen? Um, I, you don't see him think about that very much. Uh, one of the lines I said early on is his quote, he, he could not tolerate pessimism. He could not tolerate doubt from an officer. 
if you betrayed doubt, it, you were gone. He wasn't going to talk, uh, handle that at all. You must be positive. And I think he carried that over at all times. Yes, I'm going to make mistakes, but we'll move on. We'll learn and we'll move on. And they're mistakes. They're humans. They're errors. But you must continually improve. And so he looks that way. He's more optimistic, always looking forward, if that's a way to describe it. And his son survived. He, I think his son was yes. six at the time. Yes, his son survives, serves on the staff of General Marshall in World War II. And his name is Warren Pershing. Warren Pershing's two sons serve in the military, raised both, I think, over the rank of colonel or two colonel. Uh, one dies in Vietnam and one dies in 1999. He served, I believe, in some of the post uh, Vietnam Wars for the United States. So the Pershings have had a long history in the military and that, so yeah. Yes, and um, I've lived in the Washington area most of my life and I've heard Pershing's own, Pershing's own, and didn't realize until researching this that that's the that's Pershing. The Pershing. That's Pershing, yes. yes. I was always surprised Pershing's own band, but the Pershing Rifles, I thought that was some other kind of name. It came out of Pershing's short time in Nebraska training sort of a ROTC group after he'd served in the, in the plains and fighting Indians briefly. Uh, and they trained and were well coordinated and wonderful. And they started calling themselves the Pershing Rifles. And that just started to spread when he became general of the army. He was a good strategist. Uh, now, he was criticized for some of his military strategies. Of, and can you talk a tiny bit about that? We've got about two minutes left. A little yeah, left. absolutely. Uh, as we talked tonight, one gentleman asked, there's always been the thing that the armistice was very clear that it was coming. And yet he kept fighting right up to the last moment. And a lot of men died because of that. And the English and French basically stopped fighting. They just said, hey, the armistice is coming. Let's stop. And the Americans didn't. Pershing was going, because Pershing really did believe that the Germans had to be defeated completely, and he had to do as much as he could in the little time that he had. Um, he was rather ruthless in that. He was criticized quite often. And today, especially, he's looked back on that. It said that he didn't learn quickly enough. Well, he was only there for a total of 18 months and only in combat for a year. So, no one else learned very quickly. Now, the Germans had started to do what they called the Huttier tactics, which is what Liggett brought to the American army of avoiding strong points and, and running strong points and moving quickly. The Germans had started that, but only that same year, about five months before. So it wasn't like anyone learned very quickly. I mean, the British sent hundreds of thousands of people to die in a four-month period four months, hundreds of thousands. Pershing only lost 53,000 men in 12 months. So yeah, he sent men to his death. That is sort of, he would say, that's what a general's job is to do. Thank you very much. I'm very glad that you were here as it's General fun. Pershing. Yes, indeed, so for much. all of us. Thank you for joining us. You've been watching Chautauqua, Voices of the Great War. I'm Angela Rice Beamer. Good night.